<laughs> How are you? How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I love your background. That's really cool. Oh, thank you. This is my wife's idea. Yeah, that's better, <laughs> that's better than the fake uh, Zoom background that people are trying to uh, like dive uh, under the sharks. Uh. <laughs> Okay, so let's introduce Rodolfo. So thank you so much for joining us. So um, uh, Rodolfo, he is an American diplomat, sorry, an in European diplomat of internal medicine. He's a PhD and he is a professor, a researcher and a clinician at the University of Lisbon. Exactly. And I <laughs> met him when he was hesitating between being an internal medicine star or a singing star. <laughs> that's it but guess what please pay attention because probably we're gonna have like further developments on that on that life soon really uh, yeah <laughs> after we're gonna we're gonna discuss it later okay <laughs> that's uh because he said no to a tv competition because he wanted to pursue uh, his vet career so that's really interesting to know I'm so surprised how do you remember it? I mean, come on, that was massive. I don't know a lot of people that they were like going to the final of, it was a Star Academy or like, no, I, don't, <laughs> really, I don't remember the program, so. <laughs> Operación Triunfo. Operación Triunfo. <laughs> Operación Triunfo. Yes. Um, so I, I should say one thing as well, because uh, I must assume and admit here in Instagram that I always call you a neurodiva. Uh, before your success on Instagram because I predicted it actually because when I met you I said this this and I was going to be going to be an incredible neurologist you were a resident at, yeah yeah I was a period, resident right? yeah 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 so it was like around 11 years ago or 12 years ago and yeah I couldn't imagine that we we're going to be on Insta Live now in 2020 in this period it's getting really really funny You and know. thank you very much for the invitation. Well, I must assume that neuroendocrinology is something that I've never told about. So <laughs> let's gonna let's gonna do it more or less. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, guys, I I will start with the questions as always. But then it is your turn to ask questions. So I will just kind of go for some questions that I think that hopefully is going to start to interest everyone. And then any questions you have, you just drop me a message or just write it here. So my first question will be two questions. First of all, what will be your favorite neuroendocrine one and what will be your worst nightmare? So what will be the case that is kind of very common, typical, you see that is relatively easy to recognize and then we can talk a little bit about what is the worst nightmare for an internal medicine with an endocrine disease that may have neuro consequences? Yeah, um, really interesting question, that one. Um, actually, the, 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 the relationship that I like the most probably between neuroendocrinology is Cushing's disease, actually. Uh, not only the, the myotonia, but mainly the, the macro adenomas and when you have kind of neuro disease. It's not very common and it's not, it's not happen very often, but... Yeah, it's that one for me. It's the, the preferred one. I have a crush for adrenal disease. So, yeah, I like, really like Cushing's. And I think that it's an important point to discuss. And the second one, it's not really a nightmare, but it's kind of a frustrating thing. Um, it's the polyneuropathy in diabetic patients because we can't predict how, yeah. if the animal we're going to improve or not, even if you're doing your medical best. And um, this one, it's, it's the nightmare, I can assume. Yeah. And after there's the third one, I don't know if we can discuss it as well, is the problem relationship between endocrine diseases and megaesophagus because we always scrutinize them and I never find them. Yeah. Actually, I find it really, really uh, in a few percentage of cases. And I think it's always, overall in, in telemedicine, it's kind of a nightmare as well because we need to, to spend a lot of money on ruling out endocrine diseases when you have that feeling that, okay, I must scrutinize it, but I'm not pretty sure that yeah. this, this guy is going to be endocrine. Yeah, I think that probably the megasophagus, it is the nightmare for the neural internal medicine with the urinary incontinence. Ah, is, that is the other, like... My God. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I think that that's a very good point. I think that the Cushing's definitely is um, 
probably the I mean do you do you see more cushions at diabetic because I personally don't see a lot of diabetic neurodiabetic cases cushions a lot so I think that cushions it is something that we could be talking for like many hours do, do you do you see do you see more cushions than diabetics what would you say I, I think that I see more cushions than diabetics, but diabetics, when they came to me, they are more in complicated phase. So yeah. often I also find several times the, the polyneuropathy that is associated to diabetes as well. So, but it's more common cushions for sure. Yeah, I think. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk a little bit about uh, um, cushions. So I would say that the ones that they come to me, they all have, typically they come because of the macroadenoma, so the clinical mm -hmm. signs associated with like being depressed, some circling, rarely we don't really see a lot of uh, seizures, but then probably you will see, maybe you see a little bit more, and that's what I was kind of a little bit putting on the stories, a little bit more these dogs with some also muscle weakness or some changes into the muscle potentially. Um, what, yes. what, what do you find? What do you see? Because these cases, they may not come to me because they may just stay with you. It happens. It happens very often that they have the muscle weakness. Oh, and uh, most of them also has the, the panting. And you, you can justify the panting in terms of physiopathology that you have the weakness of the diaphragm and all yeah. the muscles. And um, uh, yeah, it's pretty common. If you... If I can mention the iatrogenic Cushing's within this discussion, yeah. I think that it's far more common. My feeling is that it's more common, this muscle weakness in the iatrogenic Cushing's rather than in the natural occurring hyperdenocorticism. Uh, but it's something that it's really... Very interesting. And, and there's a very good point because actually it is a direct, uh, the direct effect of the steroids over the, over the type 2 fibers on the muscle and it kind of definitely makes sense that the iatrogenic is going to be much more severe than the natural occurring definitely sure sure and it happens kind of when i have kind of a respiratory patient that is under steroids a lot of time and for a long term and they start showing some muscle weakness it a bit uh because it's in, it's important to to avoid this waste Con continuous waste in terms of muscle um, yeah. muscle activity and after on the naturally occurring cushion guides yeah they can be weak weak on the diagnosis and they have muscle weakness but actually this kind of dogs they, they tend to respond really well to medical treatment and to trilustan therapy is incredible and i think that when you start it, after the muscle weakness becomes like a second line problem, yeah. and um, overall it's going to be it's going to improve because you you pull out this catabolic state that the, the dogs are, and now they they start to 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 gain some muscle after yeah. it. So what what will be the most common presentation, uh, the most common neurological presentation that you will see in your patients that? Um, yeah, you will. Yeah, what would be the most common thing that you will see then? I, I'm. I didn't understand the question. Sorry. What would be the most common neurological uh, signs that you will see in your cushionoid uh, patients? Because, for example, in my point of view, the pseudomyotonia is extremely uncommon. But we can talk a little bit about it, and we can explain to people what it is. What do you say? Mm -hmm. The muscle weakness, you say that in the iatrogenic, a little bit more, more common than in uh, natural occurring uh, cushions. And I said that the ones that they come to me, because they have the macroadenoma, they tend to have some, some um, supratentorial intracranial disease. But mm -hmm. that's not that common either to have a macroadenoma in the brain. No, it's not common at all. I've, recently, I, have, I had two ones in French bullies, in French bulldogs, so um, that, that was that trend. And I think Dan Rosenberg and all the people from Miss Envet published a recent poster on ECVIM about yeah. it because we had that trend that French bulldogs can be a predisposed dog to macrodenomas. Actually, my two recent, but actually they didn't find it a relationship as far as I, I remember did that yeah. poster. And um, my two recent ones were, were two dogs that had a Cushing syndrome already on treatment. And uh, that on the beginning, the, the owners didn't have Spend, spend some money to do directly the brain imaging. And after, in the middle of the treatment, it was a, um, a female dog. She is not responding very well to trilostone therapy. And the only complaint that in terms 
terms of neuroscience, the owner reported is that they got stuck uh, um, up on the stairs and with, yeah. with, without, without go going down. No seizures, no, uh, no other signs, no loss of consciousness, anything, only kind of a behavior disorder. And we did a brain imaging and he has a huge tumor. Yeah. Um, this one, this one was, was, was really uh, an alert to me because actually I don't, I don't, I don't think that they, they came with, uh, with seizures and really uh, with bad no. central nervous system yeah. signs. It's subtle signs that, that should alert us, okay, you might have a microdenome, it's important to rule it out. And the other one is the kind of dog that, the kind of typical dog, all of the all signs for Cushing's, and after the appetite is not massive, they are not polyphagic, for instance, they are that kind of dog that starts to be, become picky, and you recognize this dog that has all, all of the clinical signs for Cushing's. This alerts us also for a macro. The noma. Yeah, and um, what what do you do in these no, in these dogs? Do you send? Yeah, the... but that's a very good point because I was going to say that a lot of the cases that they come to me without going through intense waxing and waning. You're going to have a dog that is one day completely normal, and then two seconds later, it's like a pancake. Doesn't want to interact. Is really staggering. Is staying in a corner, and then for a few other days, it behaves like normal. So it's really waxing and waning, very, very subtle signs. But most of my cases, they don't have the typical cushionoid presentation. Mm -hmm. They don't really have the PUPD. They don't have the, the changes into the CBC chem, maybe, but you know, they tend to be also older dogs. So you also tend to have a little bit of increased liver and size, maybe a little bit of cholesterol. So like very bad things. But you, I don't tend to see the typical cushionoid with the big bed with the PUPD, with the polyphagia, with the changes into the skin. So I think that is interesting because you will be seeing the most typical cushion and then less macroadenomas with, with neuroscience. And the neuroscience, they tend not to have that much of a typical, uh, I would say, physical appearance of a cushion dog. Mm -hmm. And what do you, do you usually do to these, these dogs? Do you, do you send it to radiation therapy? I remember that you've, you've done a, a talk with Jerome Benoit about it. Yeah. You send them all to radiation therapy, right? Yeah, no, we don't do the trastinoidal uh, uh, surgery. So we send them to radiation therapy. And, mm -hmm. and the interesting thing is that most of the times when they come to us, so, so we tend to want to do the ECTH steam and all that because we want to See also if they are uh, productive or not before we start maybe mm -hmm. some steroids for the radiation therapy because then is the big dilemma, right? You have a mm -hmm. cushionoid patient that you're going to need to put on steroids because of the radiation therapy. <laughs> it happens sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, uh, and then the, the other back kind of big parts that we start to recognize, and you're going to tell me if you have many is the strokes. Do you have a lot of your patients with uh, cushions that they develop strokes that they have a uh, vascular ischemic, so ischemic uh, accidents in the brain because of the not hypercoagulable? Very often, no. Not very often, no, due to the hypercoagulability. Those, uh, yeah, thromboemboli, it's our nightmare in cushion guard patients because you say, okay, they usually don't die if they are not treated, but there are only a few exceptions. Is yeah. tumor rupture if you have adrenal gland disease. Yeah. They have uh, gallbladder mucosal rupture as well. It can happen to bile peritonitis. And the third one is thromboemboli. I remember several of them, but most commonly I had pulmonary thromboemboli in Cushing guard patients. Not very common the, the stroke or the central nervous system associated to it. Or at least if they have, I've I've never, I don't remember if I had written. Or maybe they are TIA. Yeah, no, I have to say that we do see a lot of ischemic uh, accidents. And obviously, mm -hmm. we always do the full uh, check. They tend to be hypercoagulable, but it's very, very uncommon that we have a cushionoid uh, dog. It's not a typical presentation. And I think that it's important to remind people that when you think about the four brain signs of. Uh, uh, Cushing's disease is whether you have a macroadenoma, so you have a di directly a mass that is compressing your brain, so the clinical signs mm -hmm. are related to, to having a, a brain tumor or having an ischemic uh, accident because the dogs are whether hypercoagulable or they are hypertensive.
there was a recent paper about hypothyroid because, you know, when we do the differential diagnosis for vascular disease, we always think about hypothyroidism. And so far, I was kind of thinking it was more just like, the, again, the hyper coagulable state and the possibility of having an ischemic stroke, but there is actually some, also some interference of the thyroid hormone on brain function that we didn't know that much before. So things are progressing in that respect. Do you have a lot of thyroid uh, people, uh, dogs with uh, neuroscience? No, follow? not very common. No, 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 not at all. Yeah, you know, that's, I remember very well Lohan Cosinil because, because it was my neuro part of the residency. Um, I, I, I did it with, with him. And um, it's interesting, but it's the most common that I have is the poly polyneuropathic ones that you, you check thyroid yeah. levels. And most of them, you have a new thyroid thick syndrome. And you say that around 20 to 40% of the dogs um, with clinical hypothyroidism may have the TSH that be, are become, can become yeah. normal over the time and you can interpret them as a new thyroid thick syndrome. And uh, I remember several cases that I, I, I discussed with Laurent that we, we used to, to see say that, okay, this dog probably can have some kind of thyroid disease, it can, it can be hypothyroid, and probably we're going to need to supplement it, but I'm not 100 sure of it, and you don't do TSH stimulation tests in these dogs neither, and if it, when it is the case, so we started the low dose of levothyroxine, and dogs improve, actually, and, and sometimes we don't have the truly diagnosis of hypothyroid, we don't know if it is a, a, a classic polyneuropathy, an immune-mediated one, or what it is, but we know that actually thyroid, uh, this dog has an hypothyroxinemia that we can correct. Yeah. Um, am I 100% sure that this dog is hypothyroid? No, no, no. Yeah. No, no that but is... But if he improves, yeah, it's better. Yeah, it is. A, we had, I have a discussion recently about that because um, it's true that, you know, you tend to have all these cases that they come to you just with as you said with a low t4 a lot of also epileptic dogs and they have been treated with uh, thyroid by the uh, referring vet and then i always ask the owners okay so um, before your dog was diagnosed with uh, hypothyroidism what were the clinical presentation and once they started on a, on a thyroid supplementation did you did you see any change on what your dog was having so for me that is more like a sign that maybe this uh, therapy was doing something because it's true that having a low T4 doesn't mean that the dog is hypothyroidism. And I think that not is at all. Not at all. extremely yeah. important. But also if you think about what they do in humans, in humans they treat much more and faster people with hypothyroidism than we do also in, uh, in veterinary medicine. So I think that what you describe is a very, very good point. Because I think that sometimes we are a little bit too like, okay, the book, this is what the book says. And, you know, you need to have a T40 SH. So I think that is neither one way or the other. But personally, I think that if your medical science, they need to improve with the medication. Otherwise, like, what's the point? No? And you are touching a very interesting point because the first time that it happened to me, I was like in a first year of residency. And I was a little, a little bit stuck like, oh, but I'm, am I going to treat this with levothyroxine? And, but this dog is not hypothyroid. And Laurent told me like this, come on, how many dogs do you treat with steroids and they have a normal adrenal function? And I say, you're definitely right because we treat a lot of well, dogs with steroids and we don't, don't check adrenal function. And actually they are not all Addisonians, you know? And so this, this mystifies a, a little bit in my mind that, okay, when I have in doubt, and I, I think that polyneuropathy can be, or thyroid can be playing a role, yeah. and hypothyroxinemic can be playing a role in this polyneuropathy. So why not try yeah. a low dose levothyroxine to check if the dog is improving or not? Yeah. Um, and it's an interesting point, this one, exactly. And what about the, the laryngeal paralysis? Do, do you see it? You don't see it very often on the neuro because we, we, we manage it medically and... And uh, we find out. Yeah, no, you, you I don't do the electro, the electro. I used um, to do like crazy when I was doing my residency. In Al4, we would pour things. We would just do the EMG through the, through the mouth, like directly onto the uh, vocal cords. And we had beautiful uh, images. But um, no, to be fair, when I was in London, uh, the thing is, you know what? 
are like the surgeons, they hide these cases from us. They don't want to know. <laughs> it's true. They just like keep the dog with laryngeal paralysis. They keep it in the department. They do the laryngeal paralysis surgery. They don't want to know if the dog has a polyneuropathy or what. Um, so the ones that I see are the, are the dogs that they really have like weakness in and four limbs. So they, these, the geriatric, old dog, laryngeal paralysis, those, they don't come to neuro. Surgery completely bypass, bypass neuro. And we don't do any, again, I used to do a lot at, at four, but um, not here. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, this one, do you see a lot of these ones? Would you see them? Oh, yes, sir. Do yeah, you see them? it's not very common. We see it because like of uh, one, two, in three months, yeah. Yeah, but you, you, internal medicine will see the, laryngeal, the idiopathic laryngeal paralysis dog, not surgery. Yeah, they need me. Usually they need me to do the diagnosis and to check larynx. It's, not, it's hypomotor and it's not working very well and after I send them to surgery yeah no oh, that's good so that's good that check it. I tell you with us they don't check so um so let's let's just kind of back up a little bit for what we've been talking about so we're talking a little bit guys about a uh, Cushing's disease we see that we say that the most typical neurological presentations we will have is so the muscle weakness more likely a little bit on, on the iatrogenic uh, cushionoid so especially um remember that we are when we are using a lot of steroids um, it's going to affect the type 2 fibers so um, that's why we have the muscle loss and the muscle weakness um, pseudomyotonia is extremely rare um, in cushionoid mm -hmm. dogs this i don't think that there is a relationship i mean it will be natural cushionoid dogs i don't think that there is a relationship between being more common in adrenal or or pituitary i don't think so but but it's interesting because the the cases that I've seen they are all small dogs and pituitary dependent. But it's what came come to my mind like when they have like the a small dogs. Yes, I completely agree. More likely on a small dogs terrier type is chronic. Mm -hmm. It's a slow progressive mm -hmm. chronic. It, they look a little bit like a little soldier walking, and sometimes it can even affect the forelimbs. So it can be tricky. Diagnosis is by okay. EMG. Uh, reversible, uh, not completely. It's a bit. Of, it's a little bit like the, the those one, those diabetic ones with the polyneuropathy. We 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 don't really know what's going to happen in terms of neuro yeah. signs, and if they're going to maximize the clinical control of these dogs, particularly in those ones. So we need yeah. to be really really On confident in our trial standards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because and if they can reverse. I I think that they're going to be the, the most well-controlled well for sure. Yeah, and I think that the problem is also is how, how affected they are when you, when you see them. Then the big other group we said, we talk about being in hypercoagulable and uh, uh, hypertensive and throwing clots, which we said that it's not that common that we see, you see a little more like pulmonary, like PTEs, but we don't see that much uh, brain strokes. And... Um, then the clinical signs related to having a, a brain tumor, to having a mass inside the skull, so increased intracranial pressure, so being a little bit lethargic, waxing and waning, circling, uh, staggering, that type of thing. So that will be a little bit what we said about the cushions. For hypothyroidism, we were talking about it's to do with a T4 only, you cannot diagnose hypothyroidism, but need to be open-minded and you need to start a therapy when you have clinical signs that could improve and then your medication needs to improve clinical signs. So typical neuroscience, um, there is this vestibular of the hypothyroid dog, which I've never seen, but again, we think that there could be a relationship between the thyroid hormone and the accumulation, the deposit, like the lipid deposit into the, uh, into the vestibular cochlear nerve. So is it worth to treat a dog with a thyroid supplementation when you have a vestibular dog that you think that it has a T4 low? Of course, but you need to follow up. And then as you said, the um, polyneuropathy related to hypothyroidism, that is definitely something that is reversible or at least can respond to medication. So definitely should be, uh, should be tried. So this will be, I would say probably these are the most common, yeah, kind of endocrine, diseases yes we are missing the diabetes i probably want to discuss further 
And uh, yeah, 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 yeah. After, I must assume that it is important to, uh, we have some rare cases, namely for instance, pheochromocytoma, that you yeah. have some neuroscience, yeah. but it's extremely rare. And um, hyperthyroid cats and central nervous system signs are pretty uncommon. Um, I don't know if you have any feedback back about it but I, I think don't have that no the hyperthyroid cats it will be just like for the high blood pressure and potential uh, stroke exactly and, and behavior is, due yeah. to to hyperthyroid um, hyper t4 and uh, and after we have diabetes for and sure and then I the only thing for the to remind for the uh, hyperthyroid cats if they are on metimazole then you can have uh, myasthenia ah it's important yeah related well, point, yeah, to the to the metimazole, which that's when you then you need to irradiate the cats, right? Or you can also, there's also like, there's not like a diet that you can give. Yes, uh, you yeah. have a diet, it's uh, from eels, you have uh, Ipsom, Ipsom D, but the main problem from the diet is that uh, the, the, if you have a multi-cat environment, it's really complicated to avoid that the cat only need to strictly eat this kind of diet. Uh, so if he has an other access to iodine to other source of food yeah. and your treat your treatment is completely lost and it's important to 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 have it someone is asking here about facial paralysis and hypothyroid is yeah. interesting question yeah no exactly uh, yeah because no, it, i don't know i don't know go, if you no, want, to, want to talk go on no 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 go ahead uh, so actually it's not it's not very common to me i i i have that medical reflex to check thyroid when i have either cranial nerves or peripheral nerve dysfunction and so you have facial paralysis i i try to to uh, to evaluate t4 and tsh but as far in my clinical recent clinical experience i don't have i don't remember a case with facial paralysis and hypo t4 and do you have a recent one about it so the same, um, I think that this is, I, I know who is uh, asking, uh, and I don't know, Veru, if you have read it, I will send you the paper if you want. But until now, uh, because that is a typical differential diagnosis that you have on the book. You always have the hypothyroidism. And um, I was reading the deposit all around the nerve and how going through the foramen will compress and you will have the facial paralysis. Personally, no, I haven't yeah. seen it, um, but I have to admit that it's been just recently that I am a little bit more open about hypothyroidism because I was a little bit annoyed of all these vets diagnosing cases with a T4 and putting all these poor dogs on thyroid all their life, you know, but I, but I need to be a little bit more open-minded, but I always ask, yeah, great, so your dog is on, on thyroid supplementation, but what did he have before? and how that improved yeah. later. So, but no, I, I don't remember any specific case that I had. And you have, again, Daniela Diaz is asking, how often do we see seizures in Christian disease? Personally, as we have, we have discussed it previously, we yeah. don't see it very often. No, no, it's more kind of conscious and uh, changes and um, uh, it's not very, really common, even in macrodenoma cases. So I and and he give, gave her perspective about it recently, and me as well. And we don't see it very often. Yeah, yeah because you you the mass. So to get to an epileptogenic area of the brain, um, it's a little bit far away from the from the um, uh, from the hypothesis, and so you you will need to be like, like the limbic system, which is the um, piriform lobes, which are, will need to be huge, or the frontal, and then if it's an ischemic event, the ischemic events, they tend to be into the cerebellum, not the cortex, mm -hmm. and it's unlikely to have a, a, a hemorrhagic stroke with cushion. So yeah, it's not, it's not a tip, it's not, it shouldn't be on your top th differential diagnosis. Okay. And diabetes. Yes. So we should talk about diabetes. So you talk about diabetes because I don't know anything about diabetes. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> so you can talk. So, the only thing that I know is how expensive it is that bloody glucose uh, <laughs> thing that we, we, we keep uh, putting to the dogs that we follow. That's the only thing that I know. Um, uh, and hopefully they are increasing the use of, of the, this, this uh, stuff. Um, so actually, polyneuropathy in diabetes 
Felix. Um, it is interesting because today you published the video about um, about it. Uh, in dogs, it's far. It's really rare comparing to cats, but it doesn't mean that it only happens in cats. So it happens as well in dogs, and it's important. It's important to to highlight. Uh, so we can have polyneuropathy in dogs as well because people use dogs are are old and can have have kind of orthopedic disorder as well, but most of them may have a polyneuropathy. So it's important in my perspective as an internist to check electrolytes because as you know, um, these dogs are prone to hypokalemia and hypokalemia are also responsible for some uh, muscular weakness. So it's important definitely to check electrolytes. But um, either in dogs and in cats, polyneuropathy is kind of an unpredictable thing for me in diabetic patients. So even in, in cats, y y you do your best, you manage. And I've, I've often seen it, I don't know if it happens very often to you, and, but I've, um, I even have a recent case that the cat was polyneuropathic and I, the, the diabetes mellitus went into remission and the the cat still stayed, yeah. stayed polyneuropathic. Progress. After and even it, it almost had progress. I completely agree. The cases that I had are cases that they are not terrible. Like they have been controlled for a while. Okay, they are not perfect because I think that it's impossible that a diabetic animal is perfect. But it's true that typically cases that they are relatively well controlled. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, and and it's nice because. But I think that for the cat, the cat managed manage the problem really well. What? We don't see cats. We don't, we, they don't arrive to us. I think that a polyneuropathy in diabetic cats is so well known that they don't, no one needs us. I've, I've, okay. I, yeah. And, um, and in dogs, do you, do you have it? That case, it was really interesting that you published the video. Yes, I, not very often but I have had it. And my experience, and I want to ask you about the cats because I cut, yeah, I, of course, and I know the books and I maybe I've seen a few, but not many with the typical, like the drop hawk and they, they have this uh, palmigrad, uh, plantigrad uh, stance. Are they painful, the cats? Because the dogs, they are painful. I don't think so. It's, it was, I think that they manage it really well. Probably they, they, they mask the pain or the, the, the uncomfort that really great and yeah they are plenty great for sure we take a lot of videos when, when yeah. we see uh, one of them but they they are comfortable they, they 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 don't feel any pain as far as i as i yeah. can can what sorry yeah 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 because the ones that they can the dogs that i had they are a more in discomfort it's more like a chronic discomfort and that has been also really described in humans um, so I guess that for people listening, the trick is, it's a little bit similar to the pseudomyotonia and cushions. You don't know who is going to have it. You don't know if he's going to respond to the medication. Um, so the presentation of apolineuropathy, what will be? Will be generalized weakness. You could even consider exercise intolerance and then reduce spinal reflexes. In cat, mm -hmm. the good thing is that if they are very pathognomonic with this drop hook, so they, ha they are plantigrad and in dogs you will see as you saw on the video is a the walk of, of a dog that has a polyneuropathy so will be more paresis it's not going to be ataxia it's going to be more paresis weakness and then they do have this pain so if you do electrodiagnosis you're going to find that there is abnormal conduction and um, they so they there's different hypotheses right because there is the possibility of like what is the action of the insulin on the myelin? Because the, the, the insulin is not very friendly to the myelin. And then I think that it's more like the insulin related more than the kind of the glucose. I don't really actually remember. And you have something about Schwann cells, Schwann cells. Yeah. Uh, because they uh, induce to, to the lipid dysregulation um, that also induce kind of a loss of conductivity and um, some kind of that physiopathology mechanisms. Yeah. So what happened? Now it's actually, my time to start shivering, thinking about the words. Ah, no. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> um, well, the thing is, yeah, guys, the, the, the swan cells are going to be on the myelin. So if you have myelin, then you have a saltatory conduction of the speed. If you don't have myelin, then there is a reduced speed. And that's what you see when you do electrodiagnosis, is that the, 
So the, there is a good axon potential, so there is transmission, but it is slower. So that's why you have kind of the weakness. So again, not very common, but my experiences has been on dogs that they were relatively okay control. And in cats, we'll just say that it's, it's more common in a cat that is not well controlled or it can happen in any diabetic cat. Uh, if the dog is non-controlled, I think you have a, a high chance to develop to, to have it. But uh, after the diagnosis, if you have a good control, it's still unpredictable if this cat will gonna will gonna come back to normal or not. And sometimes they you feel that completely des desperate and think, okay, I can't manage and can't improve this polyneuropathy. And like in one or two months, they it's they, they improve. They no, they improve and he's gone and, they, yeah, and yeah. the dog is fine and the cat is fine. Sorry, yeah, it's it's really impressive and unpredictable. It's really it's really the word unpredictable. We don't we don't know what's going to happen on it. Someone is is asking here about insulin. Yes, and it's really, it's really important point. I don't know if you have still time to discuss. Yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah. I, I was going to ask you because I think that especially after speaking about diabetes, I think that insulinoma, especially because again. And we're talking about the, the, the insulin and the relationship, the insulin with the swan cells. So do you, did you see a lot of insulinomas? This one, yeah. Recently, I had kind of three or four cases, and it's kind of a disease that I really, I really, the relapse, it's pretty common. I've never seen, however, do this, that famous perineoplastic uh, syndrome. Uh -huh. uh, you have, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. I've never seen, I've read a lot in all the books, yeah, insulinoma, perineoplastic, perineoplastic, um, kind of polyneuropathy, but I've never seen. And, but neuroglycopenia, it's unfortunately pretty common in these, in these, in these dogs. And, uh, yeah, it's something that, that, um, it's one of the most common presentations in my neuro cases. It's, it's interesting. And thank you for, for raising up the question of insulinoma, Alessandra. Um, because it's an important one to discuss. So you are you were saying that you have seen a recent one. Yeah, I mean, actually not a recent one, but I have. Oh, okay, you're good. Uh, but I have had these cases, and also it was funny because where I used to work in the UK, I was working the oncology guy is the one that who published the paper. So then we will always kind of joke about uh, when we talk about the differential diagnosis of the insulinoma. Yeah, no, they are, um, they are interesting because I have had, um, yeah, just the typical dog having seizures because it's hypoglycemic, so that we do have a lot. And of course, um, in every book, you, you, it tells you that when you have a dog that is having seizures, you need to check the electrolytes and you need to check the glucose. I have not had a lot of abnormal, uh, electrolytes abnormalities with uh, seizure dogs. I haven't had a lot of hypocalcemia or a lot of uh, uh, sodium or potassium changes, but glucose is something that you need to be always, always checking. And unfortunately, it has happened to me cases coming, uh, having seizures with hypoglycemia, and actually they came with, with the CBC, with the chem, with the glycemia being very low, and the vets, they just didn't look at it. They just kind of, and I, I think we need to be careful, of course, that with the glucose reading, you, you need to make, make sure that you haven't let the, the blood hang in there for a while. But little changes in the glucose, well, I wouldn't say that it's really relevant because when you have an insulinoma, usually the glucose is pretty low. Huh? You don't really have a oh, glucose yeah. that is just on the edge of being hypo. It is well, really low. Yeah, you can have. You can have like, you can have a, a 60, for instance, milligram, milligrams per deciliter, because I know that, that sometimes you have a millimoles per liter. Yeah. Um, 60 milligrams per deciliter, uh, you can have it. And you can find, okay, this is pretty normal, and it's not. But the classical ones, I think you have all lower than 50. Yeah, yeah for sure. They're like 30, 20, yeah. And something. another important thing to remind that I always tell, talk to my students, and it's important to, to note here as well, is that when you check the glucose and insulin, you should measure both on the same sample. It's important. And it's important to consider, uh, to, to keep in our minds what will be the scenario in terms of physiology and what you're going to have. Because sometimes you have the insulin in the, in the reference range of the lab and this insulin is completely inappropriate for the glycemia for the glucose of this have. dog. Yeah, so if you have a low glucose value, it is expected to have a low insulin value. 
If you have a low glucose value with a normal insulin value, please be aware because your dog has probably an insulinoma. And it's important to remark because when people look at the reference range, they don't even stop thinking, okay, this can be an insulinoma because if it's in reference range, even if a normal yeah. insulin can be actually an insulinoma, it's yeah, important to point. keep in mind. And do you use a fructosamine when you want to check? Because for the diabetic, Ui. you're going to choose you're going to check it for the diabetic, but would you check it for the suspected insulinoma or not? You can do it, actually. I don't use it very often because you know that fructosamine has been dropping in terms of accuracy and consistency in the veterinary endocrinology world because we had recently kind of a survey to, um, to, um, from all the European labs on the European Society of Endocrinology. We had a survey to uh, validate these labs as a certificate to, to do the hormones measurement. Mm -hmm. And after fructose, I mean, it's very inconsistent from lab to lab. You have a dog in front of you and you need to collect more pieces of the puzzle when you suspect of an insulinoma, that yes, you can consider fructose as, a, as an add-on for to reinforce your diet. To then keep doing sure. your glucose to get that low glucose to send the insulin with that low glucose sample. Because there is not exactly. much point to send an insulin ratio if your glucose is normal. Uh, no. So if you want to rule out insulinoma, ideally you should pick an hypoglycemic fellow. Because otherwise, if you measure a random insulin with an, a glycemia of 50 or 60, sometimes it's really complicated to interpret, interpret this, that result. So yeah. you should ideally have an hypoglycemia. And if, the first, if you are... If you are convinced that clinically the dog matched with insulinoma and the first one that you check are inconclusive, please repeat it again. It can be exp expensive for the owners indeed, but there's a paper that says that if you repeat it in, in difficult cases, in tricky cases, you're going to find it out better on the second measurement. Mm. So that's actually a good question because again, like the, the cases that they will come to me, they are easy ones. Uh, because the glucose is so easy to measure. So for me, are they going to come whether having seizures or whether with this paraneoplastic syndrome, which typically it is a little bit of a, like a vague presentation when they are weak, sometimes they collapse, they really don't want to walk. Almost it's not as dramatic as a um, 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 hemangiosarcoma in a spleen, but you know, sometimes we have these hemangiosarcomas that they just like have an emo abdomen and they just like collapse, they are weak, they're not doing well. So the insulinoma, they can be a little bit like waxing and waning, being like weak. Um, when you do the near exam, they are okay, but they just like, they, they kind of work funny. But for me, are extremely, extremely easy cases because they all have a very low glucose. So mm -hmm. I always mm -hmm. check on any case that I have, I always check CBC chem, whether done by the vets or by me. So for me, these are easy cases. But how will, how will these cases come to you? Because actually, I have no idea. What, is it, what will be the owners will telling you in a dog with insulinoma if it's not at this new representation? So weakness, weakness. And, and um, some of them come due to lethargy and to loss of appetite. But it's interesting because they gain weight. It's important. It's one of the few tumors that induce it. So dogs with insulinoma gain weight. It's important to have it. And sometimes, so they don't eat very well. It gains weight, kind of hypothyroid dogs, you know, but yeah. actually they are not. And it's checked the glycemia and they are low. It's more or less like these ones that they come to me as a presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Or the, the vet identifies the hypoglycemia and refers to internal yeah. medicine. Yeah. And then do you, so do you usually do like a full body CT of these ones? Or how would be, what would be your uh, diagnostic so, procedure? So, yes. So ideally, we started with an abdominal ultrasound because it's particularly cheaper in Portugal comparing to, to, to the US. Mm -hmm. So we start with abdominal ultrasound to assess whether we have pancreatic nodules or not. I, complete, I measure the, the insulin as well. It's important to scrutinize all the other causes of hypoglycemia, such as hepatic insufficiency, Addison's disease, yeah. uh, xylitol intoxication, etc. You need to scrutinize all of these differentials. But after, if you have a low glycemia with a normal or high or inappropriate, I'm going to say, inappropriate insulin, then yeah, abdominal ultrasound and CT scan always, and uh, thoracic and the abdominal, ideally. Um, and 
all that fits with insulinoma, but you don't find anything. So in these cases, I try to recommend an exploratory laparotomy to, 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 to fill if you fill the nodule on the pancreatic tissue or not. But most wow. of the times now, if we find it out on the CT, yeah, yeah, because it's, it's improving. And um, in terms, if the dog is, is an advanced stage and is in show mats, it's important to mention that we have several medical treatment, octreotide, prednisolone, diazoxide, and you have recent papers about tocenanib, so the famous palladia, that can be considered as well in insulinomas, recent ones, so it's fine. It's fine because it's, you have another approach that you can have to these to this kind of, of tumors. Okay, so let's go with some questions. So what we... Um, so there's also Nirobete Quadra that was asking about the uh, pseudomyotonia, but we have had talk a little bit about on the beginning. So if you don't mind, we're going to uh, answer the other questions. Okay, so then there is a Alexander that is a, asking about the Fanconi disease, which I guess that is on the differential diagnosis of hypothyroidism or of, hypo, of uh, hypoglycemia. I'm not sure if I, this is a question or... Mm, I'm not understanding the question as well, Alexander, okay. if you could please detail yeah. it. Mm. So all the while, Gabby is asking, for how long do you consider giving a levotiroxine as a trial before ruling out hypothyro uh, hypothyroidism? So what would That's be an your interesting question, this one. Yeah. yeah, so I think that you have, yeah, thyroid hormones are, are quite, uh, um, uh, you need to, to have some time on medication. So at least three, four weeks. So, or even four to six weeks, actually. I think it's an important, uh, it's important to keep this at least three weeks minimum. Ideally, I used to do it one month later. Yeah. yeah. And I always try to do it four mm -hmm. hours after the morning pill because it's the peak of action of levothyroxine. So uh, it's, it's great to have it on the upper limit of the, or even a bit higher of the level. So that, that's actually a good point. So do you want, so do you want to see the, uh, you want to see a result? Well, yeah, actually, because you want to check, yeah, if this is the right dose. So will you be checking if there is, if there is no clinical improvement, will you still check it? Yeah. So if there is no clinical improvement, you will check it to see the level are good. And if there is a clinical improvement, you will still check it to follow up. I, I, yeah, I, tried, I try to follow up with, with a value, but uh, I always tell to students that I treat patients and I don't treat numbers. And it's important to keep it in mind. So if the dog is improvement, if improving, but your T4 level is normal, but too low, because ideally we, have, we like to have it uh, on the upper yeah. range of the limit or even a bit higher of it on four hours after pill. But if the dog is fine, I tend to keep that, that dosage. Yeah. Okay. And if the dog uh, isn't fine, uh, yeah, whether I increase or not, it all depends on the wall context. Because if the dog doesn't have other comparable signs to, um, of hypothyroidism, yeah, I don't, I don't continue the therapy. It means that, okay, it's not working. Levothyroxine is not working here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I think that we've done a good round. I'm just thinking what other like endocrine disease. Because Addison, I don't really tend to see, I, I personally don't see any. Even you could have, even for the Addisonian crisis, I, I mean, maybe our ECC service, they just like too spot on, but I, I've never had uh, any case coming to me. They are becoming becoming less common, the classical Addisonian crisis. So now we, we, we get a little bit more excited with the typical ones. So that one that all is normal and only vomit once. And well, it's not interesting for neuro yet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what have we, we done? Hypothyroid, Cushing's, insulinoma, diabetes. You have pheochromocytoma. Pheochromocytoma. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I don't think that I've never seen one in my life. Have, I, have, do you see a lot? I... We look forward <laughs> very often, but we don't see, see uh, it's not common at all. No, no, no. I think that actually, you know what? We, I need to check the values. We had a dog, and this old dog that we did um, a slot, a ventral slot, 
and he had, as we were doing the surgery, he had very, very high blood pressure, and then he recovered really well, and it really well, and was continuing to high high blood pressure. So we were going to to check. Uh, what is the name of the? What you check in the U? Um, so one thing that I would say, for example, I think that a good question will be for all these cases. For example, with cushionoid, with cushions, um, or thyroid, and you want to kind of check a thyroid hormone, and you want to check and do a stimulations. How will the anesthesia? Because imagine that we have all these cases that we've done an MRI because we're suspecting a facial paralysis, and then we want to check the thyroid hormone, or we saw, we've seen a macroadenoma, and we want to we want to see how like if the tumor is active or not. So. What would be your recommendation for doing all these tests after anesthesia or after any stressful time? So when is the right time to do the, to measure these cases? The most common example is the Cushing syndrome. And uh, when, you're, when you want to do everything and you try to schedule everything, but I always discourage to do the functional testing uh, on the same day that you do something with anesthesia or something that can be stressful for the dog. Yeah. So uh, I try to do the functional test on one day. And after stay like one or two days at home and after do the abdominal ultrasound. Because, because if you do it all in a row, yeah, probably you save time to the owner, but after you're going to have the stress that can affect your results. It is important to keep it in mind. So you should be a little bit cautious on, on it. Yeah. So you should separate things the, and do it uh, step by step individually. Yeah, when you do the ACTH steam or the uh, suppression, but when you do T4, TSH, you can do it the day. Yeah, when you do T4, TSH, you can do it. Yeah, yeah, you, you can do it um, or, or at the moment of the consultation, yeah. It's not a problem. Okay, so what will, be, what will be, let's say, the most common misbelief about... Okay, just a second, because Sonia is asking a question. Or Sonia, do you ever see hyperadrenaline? Hyperaldosteronism, uh, yeah, with neuroscience. With neuroscience, do hypertension. Yeah, interesting point. Usually, these kinds of, of hyperaldosteronism cats show mainly muscle weakness due to hypokalemia. It's really severe. Hypertension, yeah, it's present, but I don't see very commonly the neuro consequence of hypertension in these cats. It's more the muscular consequence of hypokalemia. Yeah, I don't know if you have any feedback. It's funny, it. like on cats, um, we don't see a lot of like ischemic uh, strokes in cats uh, due to hypertension. I have has I've seen those these is um, hypertensive encephalopathy in cats that, that I have seen, mm -hmm. which I have never seen in dog, and I even have one MRI in a in a cat that. Um, uh, the clinician didn't want to believe that that was the problem of the cat. So we ended up doing an MRI and we see beautiful images of a hypertensive cat. Um, so I think that is interesting, but cats with hypertension, they can have this hypertensive encephalopathy and it really looks like a diffuse metabolic encephalopathy. So it's bilateral, symmetrical, symmetrical signs, four brain signs. They are very different from dogs. I, I have to agree. They're very different from dogs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so give us some last tips, um, important things or misconceptions, a big misconception about Cushing's, about hypothyroid and about, about diabetes that you want uh, vets to not to have anymore. So misconception of Cushing's, um, well, well, well. <laughs> so we should try to do the best in terms of diagnosis ideally we should imaging the brain when possible because otherwise we can have some some disappointing histories in which that macronoma can is find out later in time hypothyroid we should be sure if you have definitely an hypothyroid or not you should check always t4 and tsh not only t4 alone and um we should um, consider clinical signs are very important to reinforce your suspicion. And it's with, with, with treat dogs and not numbers. And the third one is diabetes. Diabetes, uh, yeah, we can have uh, polyneuropathy. And unfortunately, even if you're doing your best in terms of medical management, we can predict how it's gonna work in the future. I mean, how it's gonna uh, progress. 
So it's important to keep it in mind. You are doing a great job sometimes, and the polyneuropathy still are still there. Um, so uh, please keep in mind that it's not related with, not always related with a good uh, clinical sign. For sure that it it sometimes can't happen. So don't be frustrated with it. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. And for insulinoma, I must add on that don't forget to measure both at the same sample and that insulin can actually be within the reference range and it can still be an insulinoma because it is inappropriate. If the glucose is low. If the glucose yes. is low, the insulin if the being normal, is low. that is already inappropriate because the insulin should not even be there almost if the glucose is low. There is no place for the insulin if there is no glucose. Exactly. Exactly. Well, thank you so much. That was so quick. It went really, really fast. I can't believe that we've done an hour already. Thank you, Anne. It was a great pleasure to me. And thanks for all you do in your Instagram and YouTube platforms because you're really a great, great influencer and you're really teaching marvelous neuro things to people. Thank you very much. I always knew that you were a diva, okay? And a uh, neuro diva. And it was a big pleasure to, to share this moment with you. And uh, I hope that things will keep uh, great in your life as it has been until now. Okay? Thank you. Thank you so much. And I can, can, can't wait to, to hear your news so that you're going to uh, share soon. Ah, okay. I'm going to send you a text message then after. Okay. And then uh, just uh, to finish, Felipe was also saying the mis misconception on neuroendocrinology is about the neuropeptides. I think that probably it's also related to what we were saying about hypothyroid before. So yeah, very good.